So my name is uh, Sam Bachelet. I'm from uh, New York State, the USA. Um, here to talk about um, the last few months of uh, research I've done, a project that I call Space Forms. Um, basically, uh, a little bit about myself, um, how I got into Pearl, 2000-ish, uh, 2001. Um, started playing with uh, interchange like a lot of people here. Um, and that evolved um, until around 2003. Um, started talking with Racky uh, about the next iteration of Interchange, um, the Interchange 6 project. Um, and at that point, um, started working with Racky on that. And a few, a few years later, well, met the next year, Peter uh, joined. Um, and uh, we hosted a couple of conferences at um, my resort property um, in New York, which is um, the uh, Pearl Dancer Conference last year, and then the predecessor, which was um, e-commerce innovations. So I'm excited to have everyone here. Thank you for coming. Um, it's a lot of work for everybody to put this together, and uh, it's exciting that it's finally here. So, all right, space camps. So. I also wanted to give a, um, you guys might know me by my screen handle, um, Xfusion. Um, I'm very well known for uh, confusing people with what I say, so um, Peter gave me the gracious nickname was Hex Confusion. So if at any point you feel confused during the presentation, it's actually a feature. So. <laughs> There we go. So, Space Camps is an uh, ecosystem of tools um, basically meant to deploy and manage um, containers for the use of development environments. Um, one of the main reasons why um, I got onto this topic um, was you know, being involved with the Interchange um, development team um, and in other projects, the need for um, development environments that are easily uh, reproducible with you know, different versions of Perl or Pro modules, etc. Um, that need to be the same. So um, that's very important um, when you have team environments that everyone's using the same tools, uh, the same versions. Um, and, and basically, the, um, the idea for what I'm doing now came from um, a project called DevCamps, which was started by Endpoint. Um, and basically, what it allowed was um, reproducible um, environments um, under a, a user um, directory. Um, so you could have what are called camps. Um, the short end of the story is the reason why it was is hard to use is it's, it's hard to configure. It uses non-native ports because you have all these camps going on in one uh, computer, um, which requires special configurations um, with uh, config files uh, for, say, Nginx, etc., um, interchange. Uh, so that, that hurdle made it really difficult uh, for a lot of people to use the system, and it didn't get you know, probably the, the support it deserved because it's, it's really great. But um, one important thing um, is that it wasn't portable. Um, although it could go from server to server, it required a lot of work. Um, Racky, for example, does a lot of development um, on trains, so he needs to be disconnected. Um, so the idea of a development platform, and, and, and just to step back for one second, Peter um, brought up a great point, is I don't want to use uh, all these configuration files. I don't want to have non-native ports. I want a full system with you know, default um, configurations I just want it to work. So this is kind of um, you know, how I got there. So this is you know, not simple. Um, this is basically what I do, and, and this is um, what can be confusing is all these different 
terms that maybe you haven't heard of, a lot of you probably have. Um, so we're not going to, we're going to come back to this and we're going to start a little bit simpler. Um, so this is kind of the graphical representation, a photograph of kind of the container environment, right? So you know, you've got your containers and, and, and you've got communication and then you've got, you know, all different types of um, logistical things going on here. But if you look, you know, and you start researching, it starts to become easier to see kind of what's going on. You think of, you know, Postgres or, um, as a container, um, basically the concept of, of programs as services. Um, you start to see, oh, hey, there's Docker, and you know, everyone likes Docker, and it makes sense that Docker kind of is a distribution tool for containers. And, and then, oh, yeah, you got the cloud, and you know, clouds are happy. It's just a happy place you put your stuff, and it just works, right? Clouds are magical. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, but, like, the more you research and the more you try to develop uh, anything cloud-based um, outside of just using a cloud, yeah, it's, clouds can be tough. Clouds are not always happy. You know, when clouds break, you know, it's, and clouds crash, so I mean, it's not <laughs> like... In the crash and burn in this case, but it's not just like a um, you know, silver bullet. So just to kind of reset that, but so basically I broke the um, system into three different um, pieces. So we have containers, communications, and logistics. Um, that was as simple as I could break it down with a naming on that. I, I'd ask Peter, he probably hates these names, but I'm bad at naming. So, um, after some research, um, I found there's a million different variations of what's going on in the cloud right now. Different technologies, uh, different companies. Uh, the one that really stuck out to me was CoreOS. Um, CoreOS is a port of uh, Chrome OS. Um, it's designed to give you the infrastructure basically of a major um, cloud infrastructure, like something that, say, Google would utilize. Um, and it has all the fun tools uh, included, a lot of the stuff in that previous grab, etcd, fleet, docker, um, all of this stuff is native to CoreOS, so you just basically launch it, and all these tools exist. But you have to utilize CoreOS. So talking with uh, my future boss, um, John Jensen, um, Basically, he said, Sam, I think you have a good idea here, but what's really important is I don't want to deploy CoreOS. I'm not going to do it. So basically, at that point, I was like, all right, well, I better listen to my boss here. And I took all, and then I started to research um, all of these tools, and I realized by you know, um, proper design, they utilize Go for um, these applications. So what this allowed is for you to use any um, OS you wanted. Granted, not always simply, but um, it's still cool. So, all right. So we're just going to touch lightly on what a container is. So, by definition, um, container is an object that can be used to hold uh, hold or transport something. All right. Well, simple. Um, the main difference between, um, like, say, a VM and a container is that um, the container uh, shares the host's kernel. Um, so you end up getting a lot of, uh, there's obviously benefits and negatives to that. Secure, there are some security risks, but um, and it has its own full virtual file system, much like a VM. But it's a lot lighter, right? So you know, all of you know that setting up a VM is relatively simple. But it does take quite a bit of resources. You need to allocate quite a bit of space. Or like a container, um, basically, um, can be almost no space. Um, so. When uh, I started looking at all of the different tools for running containers, okay, um, 
you know, I started looking at Docker. Um, I looked at Rocket, um, which is a core OS tool. Um, and I did some more research and found that uh, Rocket was based on um, a part of System D. Um, I know that's a dirty word to a lot of people, but um, it's kind of part of the future, I guess. So, um, System D and Swan. Um, and the author um, basically calls it, you know, change root on steroids. And I mean, it really is. It's a pretty amazing tool. Um, I, I was blown away. So here's just a few commands um, that basically can spawn um, a Jesse container. So if you look at this relatively simply, you've got deep bootstrap, um, and then end spawn, a couple of flags there. The, uh, the B means boot. D is your directory, so in this case, we're, just, we're in the same directory that we created there with uh, Jesse. So, right here. Um, so, yeah, so let's check this out. Pretty cool. Maybe. Alright. So, to save on time, I already did the bootstrap bit. Um, so you can see the uh, that in tree here, so I, I use a little different name. But there you see you have a container, boot up. Um, it doesn't create a password for you, so you do have to do that. So I did a little um, that in advance, although it looks like I forgot it. So there you go. So, you know, at this point, you're, you're in your own file system, you have your own computer um, environment. So at first, my thoughts were, oh, well, this is awesome. I'm just going to install Nginx. I'm going to install all this stuff in here. No problem. I mean, I was flamed for that initial concept. I mean, the truth is you do not want to just start layering things into containers because what you do is you eliminate portability. Once you have a container with a bunch of different applications on it, replicating that is going to be a lot harder. In a cloud environment, you want to have all these applications as separate containers and then you just basically manage them. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the important part of containers is to keep them lightweight and really a container should do one thing and that's one thing I've learned um, kind of the hard way. Okay, so system the answer on. Um, so the next thing, uh, really, I, I found Rocket first, but I wanted to explain more about system the answer on because Rocket is really a wrapper for system the answer on. Um, so system the answer on is based on, or uh, Rocket is based on Go, um, and you know it's relatively simple to use. It's much like Docker. I mean, it's got its own um, configuration file. Um, it uses um, the app container spec, um, APC, um, which was really kind of a, um, an explosion that happened um, to, to, to kind of talk about how Rocket came about. CoreOS um, is a huge um, proponent of Docker. They ship Docker, um, probably one of the biggest um, users of Docker. Um, their, uh, their CEO is, is is a major contributor to the Docker project. Um, but at one point in the beginning, um, Docker kind of had a manifesto on the website about what is a container. And it was kind of an <coughs> open, um, open area to talk about. And as things evolved, that went away. Um, Docker started to become really more than just the container um, environment. And so it started to um, distribute and and manage uh, a lot more than just a simple container. And then the idea of Docker became more than a, than a container, as I just said, but um, and everything was about Docker, the Docker file, which you know works great for Docker, but Google and CoreOS, they really wanted to see um, kind of 
kind of a, a demographic of uh, open source community usage, uh, the ability to for other people to chime in and um, to have that be a lot more open, which really the Docker situation had become closed. So these are just a couple examples of, of the different ways uh, Rocket can be used. Rocket can run uh, Docker files, um, no problem. Um, so it's it's really cool. So yeah, Docker is dead now, <laughs> but not really. I mean, their last um, the last uh, series of funding for uh, for Docker came in at like ninety four million dollars. So they're doing quite well. Um, so. And this is kind of, uh, my next slide goes over um, overlay file system. So now that we have um, used system dance on the Korea container, um, we want to replicate it, right? So if you use the bootstrap, for example, um, it downloads the whole file system um, into whatever directory you're in. But that's, you know, that's quite big. So, you know, replicating that or copying that is going to kind of put you into the same situation you may be in with uh, like a virtual machine as far as space usage. So overlay file system, um, relatively new, um, showed up in kernel uh, 3.18, but it was really been like kind of recently that it's gotten a lot of the bugs fixed. I think 4.1, I've been using that and it's pretty, pretty golden. Um, so here's just a, a quick example of how overlay file system works. But basically, overlay is um, one file system on top of another. Right? So in this example, you've got your base OS, kind of like what we just downloaded. Um, and I used that as an example, um, kind of the directory tree that I would use for a, a CAMS environment. Um, so you've got the container. So it requires two different directories, um, read-write directory and a work directory. Um, read-write is really where everything um, takes place. The work is just kind of uh, almost like a temp directory in the short term. But the result uh, is you can have your base system, um, and then with overlay, any changes made after you've made your mount, so we're going to for example, spawn, take uh, nspawn and use this directory. Now let's say we install a few applications, uh, whatever, Nginx, et cetera. What we will find is that there's no change here. The only, and the upper directory, the only um, files that exist are what you just installed. So that's super cool, right? So you've got a small footprint. Um, it's at this point reproducible, so if I install Nginx um, and it's in my upper directory, I can basically just copy that, rename it, and spawn it again. So basically, uh, at no cost, which would just be the installation files for Nginx, I've created another system. So super cool. Um, it's utilized by Rocket, but what I wanted to really do is use this stuff almost not in the hardest way possible, but kind of get to the core of how all this stuff works um, before we made any decisions on what would be next. So here's an example, as I said, of um, overlay um, using nSpawn. Um, so back to what I said, you know, so here is your base file system. Here were the, the base uh, upper directory camps and uh, you know, the, the, the final mount point, which would have been, we go back, if we go back to this this command here, which is basically the, the mount to make that work. Um, so, yeah, sweet. So, and then, um, yeah, it's it's a very exciting time now in cloud technology and in container, the whole world. I mean, just hanging out over in, in like the rocket dev. Um, IRC channel the last couple of months. I mean, that between them and like System D, I mean, there's just features just spewing everywhere. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, there's stuff that uh, exists that you know you're trying to find a, 
a system that can even run it, but it's, it's pretty wild. Alright, so that kind of wraps up the um, first part there. Um, next we're going to talk about communication. So you've got your container um, and you basically need an easy way to communicate stuff like, okay, so I'm going to replicate a container, but I need to worry about like passwords, for example. Um, I need to worry about um, you know, unit files. So um, you know, I want to run Nginx in this container. Um, how do I get it in there? You could copy and paste it, but there's other ways to do that. Um, so talk about communications. Um, So um, back to CoreOS, sweet tool um, that they came out with. Um, it's called etcd. Um, etcd again, written in Go, so very portable, um, and it's just very simple. Um, it's just a key value store um, based on roots. So um, this is an example here. Uh, we're going to use uh, etcd control, which is basically um, an application um, once you have etcd installed um, directly um, can create the transaction really simply. Now, so we'll give an example here using curl. Um, so that's the right. And then to read, uh, you've got you know, equally simple. Um, so if you think of this concept, um, you could use this for a lot of stuff. Um, you could use it for, as we said, passwords, which is kind of one of the uses. So um, this is kind of the uh, what is returned. Um, so you can see it's pretty simple, um, easy to use. So this is uh, this is definitely the core of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and all of these tools really require that to be. And it uses um, it uses Raft, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with Raft, um, but Raft is a, is a really is like a consensus protocol, and basically um, what it does it requires at least three nodes. We can do a single node for testing, but to work you need three nodes. Um, basically, go through a graph here, Raft. So in this example. You've got you know, a five node um, SMB cluster. Um, and it's built for redundancy. So if you have one go down, no problem, your data is cool. Uh, if you're to do like a, a health uh, status of the um, of the cluster, it will tell you that one of the uh, cluster nodes is down, but it's not like the end of the world. Uh, life will continue. Um, and then if you basically have less than three. Um, you're going to have, not that your data is lost, but you're not going to be able to communicate, uh, re, or excuse me, not going to be able to write to, um, to an SMB cluster. You may have full, full failure. So I would say um, if you're looking to kind of research um, something that may be useful on a lot of levels besides containers, um, SMB is really cool. It's very lightweight. Um, so check that out. All right, so along the lines of um, communications, you need um, an easy way to manage DNS. So it's very simple to run into a situation where you base things on IPs, but with containers, they're constantly spawning and, um, you know, and being destroyed. So IPs, unless they're static, which isn't always optimal, are constantly changing. So um, it's important to base things on DNS, but um, reading and writing to DN uh, all these DNS records and, um, and, uh, is, you know, it can be a problem of its own. But Skyview DNS is a very cool tool. Um, it uses etcd on the back end, so that's what's going to store um, all of the, uh, the A records and et cetera. Um, so, very, uh, it's also based on uh, written in Go, so very portable, um, super simple to set up once etcd is running. 
Um, and again, and we can see the interaction uh, for adding a, the DNS record, it's super simple. So, so basically, SkyDNS is the, it's the base directory, and then you've got etcd3 space camp dot local. Um, and it gives you, uh, the IP address in the port. So it can be, I'm using it in a very simple um, way here, but you can do some really cool stuff um, with, with that. So, um, so for example, this is when I'm setting up uh, my initial Etsy cluster, um, I use, I set the IP address there and you can see the, the big response. So basically you set your SkyDNS um, IP as the DNS for your system. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah. All right, so the next part is logistics. So I will say that this is probably the most involved part. Um, you know, the, the communication aspect of this, any passwords, um, any data. Um, it's relatively simple to set up once you have your cluster going. Um, but as far as dealing with um, you know, unit files and, and, and scheduling them and, and where they go and what you want to do as far as creating a cloud atmosphere uh, is not, not simple, but there are some great tools uh, for this. So Fleet, um, probably, probably necessary, I mean there are different applications, but because I was kind of on the core OS track and it works uh, seamless with uh, etcd, um, I went this route. Um, so Fleet is a distributed, um, and it basically um, uses systemd, which, you know, in, uh, it doesn't require it, so it can, it, it can do it on its own. So if you're on a non-systemd system, um, it's possible, still possible to use it. Um, but, um, so here's just kind of a, a, a diagram, just going to kind of go through how the process of, <coughs> how many of you have heard of like a system to unit file? So this is not really uh, that new, but it's relatively new. So basically, um, it's, it's the process that system D uses to, to boot a service, like Nginx, for example. Um, basically, um, you create the unit file um, in the fleet registry um, and then you basic then you transfer the unit file um, via etcd um, and it creates a job. So at this point um, we have let's say a startup file for nginx. We're going to use that to uh, and we want to put that onto one of our containers. Um, so it goes next to the engine. Um, the engine creates a, a job offer. So at this point, um, it looks at the specs of, um, of the unit file. Um, for example, uh, you can put in a metadata um, saying that you want it to only be launched in a container um, in your Chicago cloud, for example. So it's going to look um, on its cluster. It's going to see, OK, New York, San Francisco, up oh, is a Chicago. That's um, the um, instance. So I'm going to push that unit file into the cluster. And then at that point, it starts, um, granted, uh, Nginx would have to be um, installed so that can be part of the unit file as well. It can pull that basically as a Docker file um, and install the, uh, the image that way. Um, and then enable it to start on boot. It can even tell the um, container. Uh, to reboot if you want. And then basically once that is complete, you've got um, a response sent back to Fleet, and then um, you can query Fleet um, to basically ask you know, what's, uh, what is available. So at this point, um, if you did a Fleet control, it would show uh, uh, units. It would show that uh, Nginx is installed on node 3. So, pretty sweet. 
So here's kind of an example of a unit file. Um, the big difference between this uh, fleet unit file and the unit file you use for, say, system D, uh, it doesn't have an install, so it's replaced with uh, X fleet there. Really the only difference, everything else here is pretty similar in, in name. Um, the top is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then this is kind of uh, where things get cool. You can have multiple um, start trees, so you could download an image, you can manipulate it, you can add files, remove files, etc. Uh, what I did here was just um, simply make sure if system D had uh, Nginx running, first we want to kill it. We don't want to uh, cause any errors. Um, now to start it, I use Rocket. So we do Rocket Run, um, and then this is a shared uh, directory that would be uh, shared between the host and the container, and that's just supposed to cut down the size, but the, the gist is um, this is um, a whole image of um, an Nginx file. So it has a whole editing system um, preloaded with Nginx. Um, and then there's also a stop command so that um, remotely you can access a container and just stop the instance without having to log on or anything like that. A um, couple other extra important parts, this little thing here, conflicts. What this allows, um, in some circumstances, you may want one or more, um, you may want like 30 Nginx instances, but you know, it would be running on different ports. But in this case, I only want one, uh, so if there's an Nginx service um, on this container, it will not install again. So, and um, back to metadata, um, this is the ability to tag a container as, you know, in this case we're just using a camp name. So when I'm uh, deploying a service and I only want it to go to a specific camp, um, I can do that here. Um, I kind of cheated. Oops. Using uh, the name here as an example. But this is an example of actually a template file, so when I created it, I would use camp 10, and that's where this, would, everywhere that was used, would fill in, but just so you can understand. Have I lost everybody? Is this making any sense? Or? Is a fleet somewhat kind of like puppet or yeah? Well, I mean, it, that's a good question. It's not. It's basically a method to deploy, I mean, in a sense it is, but you're deploying unit files, right? So that's its main uh, focus is taking uh, a unit file and, and deploying it on a container. So it can't do, I mean, I guess it could, but it's main, it really has one function, you know, where like, if you wanted to get do a lot of manipulations to a file system, probably not the best tool for it, but to do a lot of manipulations with a single service, you know, it's definitely um, good for that. So it's not like a kill-all tool, and that's kind of the point of a lot of these tools is that um, they're really meant for like single use. Right, so system D, uh, everybody loves system D. Um, but, you know, it's part of the thing, it just is, we all have, I mean, Jesse shipped it, so at that point, I mean, even Racky couldn't even argue with them. He said he doesn't like it. I can still go to this, it's probably not. For now. But, um, it was a default, you can disable it. Uh, this is a, a quick example, I mean, the, guys are dead about people, but anyways, uh, simple, what is the difference between uh, system D way of doing things and, and the old way, uh, doesn't really make that big of a difference, um, but just figured I'd give that as an example. Um, and then, I wanted to just kind of simplify what I'm looking to accomplish with the camp. Um, 
I've gone over kind of lightly the different um, different technologies and stuff. So you get your base container. Um, you're going to get your commands for rocket through fleet. And then you've got Nginx and Postgres, for example, as separate containers within this container. So this way you can add and remove services um, into the container. Um, and then at that point, I was wondering, you know, I was kind of nervous as to, okay, so how is this all going to talk to each other? You have containers inside of containers. Uh, so you have DNS, I guess that's one thing. But um, you want this to really be simple for the user. So although the way I'm going to use containers isn't the way perhaps it should be if you're trying to uh, provide a cloud application, eventually there has to be somewhere for the user to go and, and to develop. So, so that's the base container, okay? Um, so inside of there, um, as I said, Nginx and Postgres. And then there's a couple of cool flags. Um, Docker, I'm sure, does the same thing. But Rocket, for example, has the host flag. So Nginx um, installs a container um, with the host flag. Natively from inside the container, uh, it will appear as if Nginx uh, is installed there. So it listens locally. Um, on port 8. So super cool there. Um, at that point, you don't have to worry about you know, connecting to um, using DNS to connect. It's just there. Well, I mean, you, have, you know, that's a new sets up the password, etc. But um, simple. Um, and then you've got uh, other problems. So you've got, uh, you know, Nginx, you have some configuration files. You've got um, Postgres, you've got uh, data directory, for example, and so what happens when this stuff goes away? Well, you've got you know, volume tags, which basically um, allows you to connect the file system of the host to the container. So if you have your uh, Postgres database um, data directory, um, you would actually share that locally onto the container. So um, and if we go back uh, about 20 slides or so, uh, there's um, system the system DNS one uh, that we started with um, the overlay file system. Well, that's where all of this data is going to occur. So this container goes away, Nginx goes away, your data is still there. It's still located um, in that small directory. So, sweet. All right, so here we are, all the way back. So I'm just going to go over this kind of quick. Um, again, I know it's a lot. Um, my throat's actually dry. Do you guys have any questions, Racky? Huh? Oh, uh, you can also do it with SS, uh, HTTPS, I guess. So SSH meaning? No, for 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 instead of for AD or for for free. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I'll show I'll show a quick example. Um, I mean, I took a tremendous amount of time reading and kind of going through all of these endless documents and stuff. So, I mean, on the coding end, I have a, a, a quick demo to show you that's pretty cool. Basically, um, uses Bash to uh, create the overlay file system and, and do all of this stuff that we talked about um, because I didn't get a chance to get it all. Hacked up, but um, just to go over this one more time. All right, so Space Camp Server. So we're not using Core OS, we're doing this the hard way. Of course, we're using Perl, right? So, all right, so we've got um, etcd proxy. Um, etcd proxy is kind of a, a lightweight way to communicate with your etcd cluster. Um, etcd is, uh, although it's cool, uh, it basically saves everything to a file, so there's a, and that's in, in RAM, so you have to really be careful on how much stuff you're doing there. Um, it's not as bad as I just made it sound, but you need to be careful. So that's where etcd proxy is cool. You don't want to install etcd um, on every single unit. You create your core cluster, and then you have your workers, right? So your workers can be camps, 
uh, came and gave the Space Camp server itself. Um, but anywhere NCD uh, and Fleet is installed is somewhere that you can deploy um, the Unibot. So, uh, so let's just start with that. So you have NCD, um, so you got Fleet as your, um, so we're going to talk, we've been talking about Nginx, that Nginx unit file uh, goes um, from Fleet to etcd, goes into uh, your cluster, gets pushed over to Fleet. Um, Fleet uh, you know, basically takes that unit file, passes it through system D. Um, in this case, uh, we use the, the proxy. Um, and then uh, Rocket gets its commands from uh, that unit file to spawn in Genetics. Okay. Um, so that's where these are uh, different, these could be whatever containers. Um, and then on the DNS side, uh, you've got your, uh, your camp DNS name, and that is basically uh, communicated from Sky DNS through uh, SED as well. All right. Just a couple of quick things. Um, my repo, which just has uh, all my stuff still in dev, um, but I will uh, post that all in master so you guys can play around with it. But this is an example of usage of uh, space camps. So basically, at this point, um, we can use uh, space camps to build PDC. Originally, it was going to be a ProLancer conference uh, interchange six. Uh, repo, so I was going to build that. Um, but in this case, uh, you have your repo and you have your camp number, um, and then you can launch that as well. Um, another final feature of System D is this cool thing called MSS My Machine. Um, so if you spawn, uh, use NSpawn, use an NSpawn template or machine control, um, instantly you gain access uh, to the unit, um, um, not necessarily by DNS, it's just some kind of magic number, you know, that's how it happens. But um, you can SSH right to the name of your camp without uh, any configuration. So, and that's, that's pretty sweet. So, what now? Basically, um, so moving um, the scripts out of Dash and Perl. Um, I started doing that, but you know it's just a time thing. Um, definitely think there's an opportunity for like uh, uh, plugins with the um, with some of these tools to kind of facilitate um, you know, making this stuff easier using Dancer. Um, and then you know basically like a Dancer to the user interface. Much along the lines of like what would be, um, you know, like digital ocean. I mean, obviously that's a very lofty goal, but just as an example, um, you can basically <coughs> visualize this stuff and make it um, a little more user friendly. And then before, uh, I'm a little bit over, but um, before uh, we go, things to think about. If any of this stuff is of interest to you, you should check it out. Uh, Google's project. Google is behind the scenes and all this stuff. I mean, they're everywhere, obviously. But this is their big baby, uh, Kubernetes. Um, and this is uh, Chelsea Hightower, one of their big engineers um, from CoreOS. And he used uh, Tetris as an example. Um, I think it's a good one. It's, it's easy to, to build containers, but it's not so easy to, um, to, man to manage them, to um, to control them, because basically each SME cluster um, can, can have uh, so many different types of, of units, um, scheduling and all that stuff um, for redundancy can be like really complicated, and that's where Kubernetes comes in. Um, I only lightly got into it, um, and then almost had a panic attack, so I don't want to leave it here for now, but this is really cool. All right. Are you guys confused? 
So, um, just real quick, uh, we're a little over, but I'm just going to show you kind of the demo just because I've got it. Maybe. Yeah. So the bad news, as you see right away, everything is run on the root. It's just the way of containers. No. So, kind of go over the human file in just a quick second, but basically we went through um, quite a bit of stuff here. Um, but basically, I installed some applications, uh, enabled uh, systemd network, which is important for <coughs> my next step. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so it spawned. Um, Basically, the overlay file system and created those units um, and enabled them. So, uh, so let's launch it now. Now you can see the overlay um, was created. Okay, now you And as promised. So all of that, those steps were um, initiated, um, the container was created, um, and yeah, I mean the next steps would have been to deploy the, the rocket instance and connected all that stuff. Um, so you would have had, for example, Nginx going there. Um, so that's where I am. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you.